Last Sunday was our fourth Sunday, worshiping at home as a family over Zoom with our local congregation. And I think one of the things I'm most looking forward to is getting back with um, my friends and family, really my church family, to be able to worship in person. But in the meantime, like everyone else, we are using the technology available to us and worshiping from our own living rooms. And I thought that it would be a wonderful opportunity to just share some thoughts about how we can still honor the Lord's Day and set Sunday apart, how we can still worship the Lord, um, even in these sort of unique situations. And I knew there was no one I wanted to talk to uh, more than Pastor Zachary Simmons. Hi, Zachary. <laughs> Uh, Zachary, Hi, <laughs> Zachary is um, a pastor of Resurrection OPC in State College, Pennsylvania, and he also happens to be my brother, so I really am looking forward to his perspective today. Um, Zach, I was wondering if you could start just sort of, I thought it would be interesting, we could both sort of say what a typical Sunday has looked like in normal life for our families and then what Sundays are looking like now. So what did a typical Sunday look like for your family? Sure. Uh, typical Sunday uh, is really defined by morning and evening worship for us. Um, our, our church has a morning service and an evening service. And so that's the way we kind of bookend our Lord's Day, uh, worshiping with God's people. And that really kind of sets the stage for everything else we do on Sunday. Um, even on Saturday night, Saturday night's bath night, get everybody freshened up and um, have, have breakfast together on Sunday morning and get, get, out, get out the door to church. And it's often in a flurry and a rush with four little kids. Um, but we, we make it there eventually and uh, uh, have Sunday school and worship and come home often on Sunday afternoons, not every Sunday, but often we have somebody over for lunch or a group. Once a month, we'll have the students. We live in a university town, so we'll have students over once a month for college and young adult fellowship. Uh, we'll try to have other folks from church over, but we don't do that every Sunday. In fact, we make a point of not doing that every single Sunday because it can get kind of exhausting and burn out on that level of hospitality. Um, but we try to make that a real regular part of our Lord's Days, a way to continue that fellowship with people from church and um, be able to spend the day really intentionally together. The rest of the afternoon kind of varies. We try to take seriously, um, you know, resting all that day with a, uh, you know, trying to set it, set the day apart <clears throat> to serve the Lord and to think about Him and um, to do things that are different from our normal routine, both in terms of work and play. Um, but, you know, what exactly that looks like varies from week to week. Sometimes we're more tired and that some, some of that rest needs to be more literal napping. Other times it can be a little more active, reading, spending time with the children. If it's nice outside, we try to just have good family time outdoors. So anyway, the rest of the day varies. And we're always gathering again uh, on Sunday night at six o'clock and um, for evening worship. That's that's kind of a, our Lord's Day. Yeah, and it's very similar to ours as well. So although I am in this lovely stage now, we're on Sunday mornings, everyone gets themselves up gets themselves dressed, gets themselves breakfast. <laughs> I am just really starting to see, I know, the fruit of my labor. <laughs> uh, my it youngest. so nice. Yeah, I know. You'll get there. My youngest is a new five-year-old. So it's a whole different ball gown, uh, ball gown, <laughs> a whole different <laughs> ball game when they're all little. But for our family, um, we have to leave the house by 9.15 to get to our church. So we actually... There's a lot of flexibility. Like I said, everyone's pretty independent now at this point. Um, but we have everyone has to meet and be sitting in a seat in the living room at 845. And again, this is our typical routine. And at 845, um, my husband will read whatever the sermon text is going to be for the day. Uh, maybe kind of talk about it a little bit. That kind of helps the younger children prepare to listen for certain themes or ideas in the sermon. Uh, and then we will sing a psalm or a hymn, sometimes one that's going to be in morning worship, sometimes just whatever we feel like singing. 
And then Sunday morning worship, often I'm playing the piano, um, often we're greeting, and Sunday school. Sometimes we'll have people over for lunch, like you said, or have a fellowship lunch with our church family, um, and then back for evening worship and prayer time in the evenings. So very similar in many ways with those bookends of morning and evening worship, but I think it, it's been a little easier for me the past year or so now that my kids are, are getting older. Well, how have things changed or have they, I mean, obviously they've changed because you're home, but um, does, does sort of the routine look a little different for you now? And you're a pastor, so how is that working? Well, there have been some things that have stayed the same many things that have stayed the same. In fact, more has stayed the same than has changed for us on Sundays. And that's partly due to the way our, our churches uh, decide to keep our morning and evening routine. We are providing guided household worship materials for families to be able to worship in their homes um, and then having a sermon live stream. And that's been the biggest difference is since I'm the one preaching and I'm the one having to do that live stream broadcast. There's a lot more technology in our living room than usual. Thankfully, every Sunday it's become a little bit easier as we've gotten used to the process. And uh, it's been a little bit disruptive. And um, probably for me, the main thing is just being a little distracted from the rest of the family. Harder. It, it's Sundays, Sunday mornings and evenings are always, always distracting, preparing for the, the public ministry that I'm about to engage in perhaps even more so now with all the technology to, to keep my attention, um, a little harder to stay engaged with the kids and with Annie. Um, but more things have stayed the same than have been different. Uh, we still get up and have our breakfast together. We still, then we, we have our, our worship, but it's a little bit, maybe a little more relaxed because um, we don't have the rush of getting out the door. Uh, and so that's uh, a nice little respite. Um, but then in between, our Sunday afternoon is real similar to the way it was before, and then we gather back up for the evening right before the children go to bed. So, Yeah. Well, I before we move on, because I really want this to bring some really practical and well, practical tips and then just encouragement. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who just misses the public ministry of the word with the body together in real life where you can, you know, hold each other's hands. Um, but before we kind of get to practical and encouragement, let's get sort of a big picture. Like, why does this conversation even matter? Um, why are we having it? Why are we taking the time to talk about ways of setting Sunday apart and making it special while we're home? So I was wondering if you could kind of give us like a brief bird's eye view of what is the Lord's Day and why is it important? Uh, the Lord's Day is, we call the, the Christian Sabbath. And we use those terms carefully because both parts of that are important. Uh, the Sabbath has its origins, uh, not as people sometimes think of it in the ceremonial law of Moses. The Sabbath has its origins in the creation of the world. The way that God himself worked for six days and on the seventh day he rested. And it's really interesting that in Exodus chapter 20, when the Lord is giving the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, and he says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, and the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and so on. Uh, what's the reason that he gives? He says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the seas and everything that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. He's grounding that Sabbath commandment in creation. It's built into the fabric of the world and God's own pattern for work and rest. Work and rest, which of course God didn't rest because he, he needed uh, to take a break because God doesn't get tired. He's omnipotent. He has all power. All of, all of that was, it was a covenantal action by God revealing something to his people about the destiny of creation, what he was getting creation ready for, which is ultimately the new heavens and the new earth. That was the destiny of creation even from the very beginning. And that ultimate Sabbath rest that even Adam in the Garden of Eden was being prepared for in the age to come. And so now, uh, as Christians, we still celebrate the Sabbath, but we do it differently because a very important event has happened between the creation of the world and even Sinai and now, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, which is the first fruits of a new creation that God is making. And that use of creation imagery in the New Testament for the resurrection of Christ is, is an important part 
of why Resurrection Day, the first day of the week, is now the Christian Sabbath instead of the seventh day as it was throughout the Old Testament. And um, it's also telling when we think about, you know, some people might think, well, isn't the Sabbath really an Old Testament institution? Isn't it, isn't it something that the coming of Christ fulfilled? Isn't it like the sacrifices or like the temple or like the Passover and so many of the other feasts and events in the calendar of ancient Israel that we don't celebrate anymore? Well, the answer is no. And that's partly because number one, the Lord Jesus never abrogated the Sabbath command in his own ministry. In fact, he kept the Sabbath. He famously critiqued the Pharisees and um, others like them for the ways that they kept or abused the Sabbath, not because they cared about it too much, but because they misunderstood what it was all about all along. And then finally, you just point to Hebrews chapter four, where the author of Hebrews points out that there remains yet a rest for the people of God. You know, we live in between the already and the not yet of God saving work for us. And that not yet is still to come in, uh, in the new heavens and the new earth, a rest that God still has for us to enter. And as long as we haven't entered into that final rest yet, the weekly Sabbath still has a function, a vital function in the Christian life for preparing us for that final rest and for teaching us that we're not there yet. And we need that weekly pattern uh, to keep getting us ready. And I love how it's set up right there at the first of the week, that first day. And my pastor actually just passed Sunday was, was bringing up the point that even its position in the calendar now, you know, it tells us this is, this is first, this is most important. And it sets the course for the rest of our week. So it's, it's the best day of the week for sure. Amen. Well, let's talk a little bit about sort of this weird situation we're finding ourselves in. I'm so thankful for modern technology. I mean, I can talk to you in Pennsylvania and um, I can worship and, you know, see sermons and things like that on Sundays from my living room. But one thing I've noticed is it's really kind of difficult to stay engaged as the congregation or as a congregant when it's on a screen because it's too much like watching a movie. It's too easy. Like my tendency would just to start consuming, I guess, and zone out a little bit. So what are some ways we can stay engaged and be an active worshiper while we're kind of separated from one another? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think it's important to point out that um, that problem of being a spectator in worship is isn't something that just started happening when we all had to start tuning in to live streams from home. Uh, that is a constant temptation week in and week out every Sunday to sit in the gathered assembly of God's people and to, to be there as a spectator rather than as a participant. Uh, that's the constant downward drag of our flesh trying to distort what the worship of God is really supposed to be all about. Um, I think that engaging over the medium of the internet certainly heightens that temptation and makes it uh, easier when not having the accountability of that embodied group of people around us um, to, to help us to spur us on to be engaged does make it a lot harder. But in, in a lot of respects, times of crisis like this don't so much define or change as much as they reveal um, our hearts. Um, and um, so, we're probably just experiencing more of uh, the temptations and um, and other aspects of worship that we were already. So to stay engaged at any time in worship requires an active uh, activity of our hearts, you know, that when the pastor prays, that's not something for us to listen to. That's for us to, that's something for us to engage in from our hearts so that we are all praying with him. And when he speaks to us, the word of God that we listen as though it is really life-giving, living and active um, source of hope and life and change that we need in our hearts and being eager for it, hungering and thirsting after. I love Psalm 42. It's the one that starts as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for God. Um, that picture of this thirsty deer out in the wilderness, maybe during a drought or can't find a stream. 
And then, but the interesting thing is later in that psalm, he talks about how he remembers how he used to go with the throng to the corporate gathering, and now uh, somehow he's providentially hindered from um, that joyful gathering of believers, and it makes him thirsty and hungry for the Lord himself. And Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And that's what we should go expecting in whatever form, however uh, limited and problematic the Lord chooses to give us that daily bread of his word and um, open up that opportunity for us to commune with him and with his people together. Yeah, he has not left us orphans, right? He is still with us and his spirit is with us. And that has not changed. I mean, the one whom we're worshiping has remained the same, um, even in this, this challenging time. I will say you were bringing up hungering and thirsting. I was telling John recently, I think that when we are able to come back together and participate in the Lord's Supper together, oh, that's going to be such a glorious day as well to be able to hear the preached word and participate in that, that beautiful picture of our union with Christ together. That is something that I am looking forward to resuming. I think so too. I can't wait. Yeah, which is how we should should feel anytime like every week we should be like oh i can't wait to come to the house of the lord this sunday so i really like what you were saying that it's doing more to reveal our hearts both both the godly desires that god has given us that godly hunger for him um as well as our sinful tendencies that maybe are bubbling up to the surface a little more now mm -hmm. yeah we always have to remember we don't go to church to be entertained we go to offer a sacrifice of praise to the living God, to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to him. Um, and so that's a, a duty of, of obedience, joyful <laughs> obedience to the Lord. And we don't come just to, to get something out of it. Yeah. Well, I have a question sort of a little bit practical. Um, I am probably not the only person who has occasionally over the past month lost track of what day of the week it is. <laughs> I'll be like, wait, is this Tuesday? Is this Wednesday? Because all of the sort of normal scheduling or things we would go out and do, those hooks that kind of oriented us to the calendar are gone. Um, and it's really important to me that Sunday still be different, um, that we somehow set it apart and really remember that this is Sunday. This is still the Lord's Day. Um, and I was wondering how your family, I mean, obviously, I guess you're still having to preach <laughs> and there's a bunch of technology in your living room. So that sets it apart in one way. But how are you guys making sure to still make Sunday, you know, special and set it apart right now? Yeah, as the pastor's family, we don't have any trouble realizing that it's Sunday. <laughs> Pretty much turns our lives upside down for a day, but in, in a good way that, that we really do love. Uh, we love being just completely immersed together as a family <clears throat> in the public ministry of, with the church. Um, so maybe it might be a little bit easier for, for a pastor's family than others just to mark the day and have it seem different from the others. But it's something really that any family can do. And it starts with being fully engaged with whatever resources your church is providing for you to have access to some form of discipleship, worship, teaching, fellowship on the Lord's day, uh, making it your top priority that this is, this is what we do family. This is the most important thing that's going to happen today is for us to hear from God's word for us to worship in whatever form your church is, 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 uh, has ranged to do that under the circumstances. Um, and if possible, this is really big. I've mentioned this for our family, uh, doing it morning, e evening, uh, bookending the day that way. Um, is really valuable for setting the whole day apart um, so that it's not sort of, well, we, we check the box on Sunday morning and the rest of the day is going to feel basically like Saturday. That's really not what the Lord's Day should be like. It's not Sunday fun day. Um, it's, uh, it's something for, uh, it's, a, it's a time for the, the Lord to use the whole day to nurture our souls and to do that with joy and in, in, in proactive ways. And, and for, for kids, you know, that varies with the different children's ages. Our kids are just starting to get into a stage where we can be a little more intentional in guiding their activities to be a little more set apart, the way that they play, the things that they read, perhaps. Um, but, and I, sh I should have said this at the very beginning, uh, 
we don't see ourselves as perfect Sabbath keepers. <laughs> we think about, we, you know, read the fourth commandment and I want to confess our sins. We got to confess our Sabbath breaking all the time, you know, uh, ways that we need to be doing a better job of setting the day apart. And so that's a, a constant way we want to be growing and learning. But, uh, you know, there, there can be opportunities for children. Well, why don't you read these books today? These are the books that you get to read, especially on the Lord's Day, these, these wonderful books about things that are a little different than what you might read during the rest of the week. Um, and, uh, you know, other things that kids do, that's something we want. We want to grow in over time and something, of course, that our families will keep having conversations about as our kids mature, how they can uh, set apart their, their play in a different way as well. You can just tell kids to stop playing. But how can they learn that this is a, a holy a holy day? It's for a special purpose, not just like any other. Yeah, we have a lot of um, like children's board books, all the way up to more like chapter books or missionary biographies. And we try to keep those organized on one particular shelf, and we call it our Sunday shelf. And it's not because they don't read those books if, unless it's Sunday. But it is sort of an easy way on Sunday, even for the younger children, to just be able to be like, hey, go grab anything you want off the Sunday shelf and, and you can read it or I'll read it to you. Um, so it's more like, hey, you have, you have all the trees in the garden. <laughs> you know, like, go right, get yeah. something off of this shelf as the Sunday shelf. Um, and same thing, like there are different missionary, even TV shows or some documentaries um, related to theology or God's creation um, that really still fill our hearts with love and wonder and delight and praise for God. And so those are things that the kids also will often get to do on a Sunday afternoon. And it's something they look forward to, they look forward to. And then of course my my older and my teen and almost teen um, they have different theology books they like to read, or they have certain podcasts they're trying to keep up with, or, you know, getting to, to see different, their own things that they're wanting to study. And it's really neat to see them, like, setting, setting aside their Sunday afternoons for that purpose. So, mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah, that's really fun. Uh, when, well, this is also something, this is not something when, when, like, the right way to do it. It has helped me personally in this particular season where it doesn't really feel like I'm going to church. It feels like I'm going to my living room where I spend most of my life anyway. And um, I've been trying to really be purposeful to like still get up, take a shower, like put on my Sunday dress, you know, and that just sort of helps my mindset where I'm not coming in my pajamas. Um, again, that's an external thing that has not to do with the heart and the heart my attitude could still stink even if I'm in a Sunday dress, but it has sort of helped me just remember, okay, I'm going to take this seriously and, and still actively engage in the Sunday. So I agree. I, yeah. It's a great idea. Not coming in your pajamas. It's a good way to put yourself in the mindset that you're really coming to do something special here. Yes, you're exactly. Not just, to be your team, not just to take it easy. Yeah, exactly. Well, you are still in the thick of things with lots of little kids at home. And I know I kind of, you know, humble bragged at the beginning, all my kids can feed themselves now and buckle themselves even in the car now on the way to church. It's amazing. But um, what are some strategies that you guys or some tools or how are you making Sunday still a day of rest when you've got all these little people still at home? And, and this is, again, probably doesn't really change from a typical Sunday to where we are now. But for my readers who have lots of littles at home, what words of encouragement do you have for them? Yeah. Well, you know, the Lord um, doesn't meet us in some rarefied ideal world where our, all our children are perfect and don't have any needs. He meets us in the realities of life that he and his providence has, has called us to. And so the Lord hasn't given us some, some Sabbath command that doesn't work for families with little kids. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we can engage in as a family, knowing that life is going to be full and busy with lots, lots of needs that, that don't stop just because now it's a special holy day. Um, and, and in fact, we, we've got to remember that when the Bible talks about rest, the Bible doesn't mean the same thing by rest that we often hear or that 
that we bring to those passages. And, and you think about the way that Jesus spent his Sabbath days. It's not that he didn't keep the Sabbath, but he kept them actively. And uh, you think about the times when he went into the synagogue and, and healed a person. He says, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath, to save life, to heal? And an obvious answer is yes, of course, although that greatly angered the religious leaders of the time. And what that teaches us is not, oh, look, Jesus didn't think the Sabbath still applies anymore. No, quite the contrary. He's interpreting for us what the Sabbath is all about, which is not about pursuing our own leisure and kicking back and taking life easy. It, it's, it's about actively serving the Lord in a holy way that includes uh, serving these little people who depend on us uh, for everything. And so those needs aren't going to go away, but just because they don't doesn't mean that you can't rest on the Lord's day, that you can't keep it holy, and, or that the Lord is somehow then powerless to refresh you mm -hmm. and uh, to fill you with uh, his life-giving word uh, and to commune with you by his spirit in the midst of that craziness of everyday life, not um, somehow separated from it where you distill all that stuff away and you just get to be the saint on a mountaintop. That's uh, not, not the Bible's picture of the Christian life <clears throat> on Lord's Day or any other day. Um, yeah. Yeah. Amen. That, thank you. That's, that's an encouraging, encouraging reminder that we all need to hear no matter what the practical realities of life in our family or our situation look like, but that God is able to do his work in us outside of circumstance. He's not limited, limited by those circumstances. Well, my main audience, obviously, um, if you're here, you're probably coming from humility and doxology.com. And we are, you know, primarily homeschool families over there, although not exclusively. But I did want to just take this opportunity while I am talking to you to um, hopefully provide a little broader encouragement as well to, to all believers. And so those who, for whatever reason, are worshiping alone, whether they're single or having to remain uh, separated from family, those who are, are worshiping at home really alone right now, um, what words would you say to them or how can they, how can they worship the Lord by themselves? Mm hmm. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, it is a, a challenge for any Christian to be alone at any time of life. It's a challenge to be a single person in the church, even when you're able to go to the corporate gatherings. How much more when you're uh, isolated in your house and uh, that isolation builds over time. And uh, so, of course, the first thing to remember is that when we are the most alone, we are not completely alone. Psalm 139 is a psalm that you should read and reread and memorize if you can and uh, make it just a part of your soul and your mental furniture to know that there's nowhere that you can go from God's presence. Um, and that is a truth to comfort you, it is a truth to sustain you, it's a truth to convict you and to keep you from temptation, the temptations that can come uniquely when we're alone uh, for long periods of time and of, of all different kinds and descriptions. And so the Lord is with you. Um, if you ascend into heaven, he's there. If you make your bed in Sheol, if you dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there his hand will lead you, his right hand will take hold of you. Even the darkness is not dark to him. All those precious promises of Psalm 139. Um, another thing though is um, there's uh, a sense in which we are alone as we choose to be. Now, there are a lot of things right now that are outside of our control. But I would encourage single people in the church not to wait for others to reach out to you. I hope that other people in your churches are reaching out to you, that they are thinking what can we be doing to encourage the singles uh, who, are, who are in our congregation? Or the widows, the widowers, people who um, are, are living alone and aren't having the fellowship they are used to. But even if they aren't, be, be willing to be the one to take the first step. Be willing to think of others, think how can I be a blessing to someone else and find blessing and fellowship in that. And so being willing to take that first step, just to pick up the phone, 
or whatever other medium to connect with people, often it just takes somebody going first and being willing to take that, take that step to really become a blessing to at least two, if not more. Yeah. I have some just precious uh, friends who have been so faithful to do that many times to be the one to also reach out um, and not wait wait on me um, to reach out to them every time first. And I, I, that's so, so important. So thank you for that. Um, and it, it ends up being a blessing. It really ends up being a blessing to the whole congregation, to many of us. Well, there was a specific question um, that I got um, actually over Instagram. And this is though a question I think that many people may be able to relate to because for many families, one spouse is required to work on Sunday by reason of necessity. Perhaps they are in a medical field. And of course, if you're in a medical field or something else like that, you're still having to go into work now. And so you have a spouse who it was probably already a bit of a challenge to take the children to church by yourself and, you know, juggle the baby and the toddler and the small children. Um, but now there's the additional burden of trying to help your small children worship in your living room without your spouse. So what would be some, some helpful things that we could share for families in that situation? Boy, um, I certainly won't be able to offer any magic bullet. My heart goes out to folks who are in that circumstance and, and particularly those who are in the medical field, who have spouses in the medical field, one, one member of the household who has to be away from home and that leaves the others, uh, others back at the house. Uh, thank you because you are part of the effort every bit as much as your spouse is. Um, the effort to help our entire community and country and, and your local community and all of those things. Um, so um, just really grateful for the people who are doing that in their homes and the people who are not using that as an excuse then, well, let's just take this week off from worshiping God. No, but remember what we were talking about earlier that the Lord meets us in the reality of life, not in a rarefied ideal world where everything gets stripped away and we're just left with us and him. And um, so I think that what the Lord would have us to do is to do our best with the circumstances that we have, to endure it. Uh, the Lord knows that it's a form of suffering, but suffering is a part of the Christian life that the Lord has built in to make us more like Jesus. And that suffering can't even include the struggle with the reality of life trying to engage in worship with a lot of little kids. It's, it's part of God. Uh, making you stronger inside as part of God uh, conforming you to the image of his son as he uses your kids as at so many other times in your life um, to poke at your weaknesses and then to build you up by the power of his spirit to help you to be more patient, to help you to be more loving, to help you to have more self-control, all those fruits of the Holy Spirit that he's growing in your heart. And um, now, as far as some maybe really rubber meets the road kinds of things to do, um, I imagine those asking this question already have strategies that they use with their kids in worship. Um, uh, for example, depending on their age, having, having them draw pictures of the things that they hear or see in the sermon, giving them quiet crafts that they can do. Uh, Pre-activity dialogue is huge in our family. If we explain to our little kids ahead of time, Here's what's about to happen. Here's what you're going to be expected to do. Here's when it's going to be over. And, and, you know, giving them an end point so they know what to expect. Sometimes our kids will surprise us with um, how quiet and still they can be when they know what to expect. And, and that can make a big difference. Sometimes our kids can surprise us with how not quiet and still they can be no matter how hard we try and we've experienced that too i mean um i, I sympathize with this question in a very personal way because not so much me but my wife you know if i'm up there preaching on the well, this side of the camera and my kids are sitting there on the couch on the other side and interestingly one of the most common bits of feedback you know i think oh what do people think of the sermon and you know how how you know, wonderful, how, how much did they grow spiritually because of the things that I just preached? And 
the comment we most frequently get is, oh, we loved hearing Evelyn in the background. <laughs> that's the baby, our 10-month-old. Um, anyway, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, but that's, it's just real. It's, it's real life. We're here in our homes. We're all trying to do our best. And the Lord knows that, and he's with us in the midst of it. And, and he's going to help us through and uh, just he's teaching us to look for it all the more to ha and teaching us to value and appreciate the covenant community aspect of worshiping together as families, because having a church culture where our children are welcomed and where people help and contribute to having the kids there and making that work, that really is a whole church effort. So to feel in your home that it's even harder than being at church, that's a, a really good sign uh, mm -hmm. about the church that you're in. So. That is a really encouraged. good point. Yeah. Oh, that is such a good point. Well, before we wrap up, I actually just wanted to ask um, a question as, as a member of a congregation. All of us are having these, these pastors who are sacrificing and working so hard in unique situations to still bring the word of God to us, to still pray with and for us. Um, and we don't get to go up to them after church and uh, shake their hands. Oh, pastor, thank you for your message. Um, what are some ways that we can really be encouraging and supporting our pastors right now? Like, what do you think? I mean, obviously, you're just one pastor. But what would you want people to know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There have been a lot of uh, things going around the internet, little sayings and memes and whatnot. One of them is, just remember your pastor has never pastored a congregation through a global pandemic before. And uh, that's absolutely right. Um, just as, as a member of a congregation, treat your pastor with compassion and understanding, know that he is a sinner and that if, if he if he's ought to be in the ministry, he knows he's a sinner <laughs> and he feels very keenly his weaknesses and his limitations and the brand newness of everything that he's trying to lead your church through. Um, so be quick to encourage, um, slow to criticize. It's not to say that pastors shouldn't be criticized or that they're above criticism, but uh, church members should be cautious to think, why am I offering this criticism? How am I offering it? Um, is this really going to do some good? Um, is this the right time and the right way? And, uh, and offering abundant encouragement, um, not flattery, not flattery. Pastors can tell the difference, feel the difference between flattery and encouragement. Um, and uh, at our best, we want to reject the former and embrace the latter. Encouragement is very valuable for helping your pastor. And so encourage him, um, trust him and the other leaders of your church. Uh, follow willingly, even if you think, well, if I were in charge, I might do things a little bit differently. Well, you're not, and that's okay. And that doesn't mean that they're doing everything right or that it couldn't be done better. But it does mean that we're to the good shepherd who is perfect and who is going to lead his church successfully through this crisis, just as he has every other crisis down through the centuries um, to a glorious ending um when he returns so well i don't know a better way to end than with that hopeful promise uh, of our shepherd our good shepherd um for anyone who may be in the state college pennsylvania area could you tell us the um, website for your church if they're looking for a church home sure we're resurrection orthodox presbyterian church in state college pennsylvania and the website is resurrectionopc.org Great. Zachary, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. I'm very thankful for you. I'm glad you're my brother, and I'm thankful that God has, has brought you um, to ministry. Just remember praying for that for years when we were little even. So it's very exciting to see God answering those prayers and continuing to answer them. And I want you to know that we are praying for you and for all the many pastors and elders who are who are serving the church now as they do every week. Um, and I will talk to you later. Oh, I guess I don't even know if I said any time at the beginning, but I'm Amy. <laughs> and Amy Sloan, second generation homeschool mom. And you can find me online at humilityanddoxology.com. All right, talk to you later.